Well, those of you in the community who have attended these lectures before know that I have a well-earned reputation for not deciding what I'm going to talk about until I walk out on the stage. <laughs> and uh, that is not quite the case today, but it's pretty close to it. I, I was pondering what I might discuss with you today, and I thought about a brief conversation I had with one of the fellows uh, who may be slightly bored when he hears some of the things that I'm about to say, but for the rest of you, uh, perhaps it will, it will be of interest. And what I want to talk about is performance. I want to talk about the wellsprings of musical performance, that is, uh, the path from looking at a printed text to the act of communication with an audience. Um, some of you may think that that's what we might call interpretation. And so I want to discuss the, the concept of performance and what lies behind it, and the whole idea of interpretation, which implies that there is something about the message that a composer of music propounds in a score which is left undefined and becomes the responsibility of the performer to ferret out, and that it might admit the possibility of not only taking certain licenses, but in fact treating a piece of music as a vehicle for personal display and invoking a right to alter, sometimes to the point of almost uh, unrecognizability, what's on the page, playing loud what it says to play soft, playing slurred when it says to play separately. And there are musicians who have done this without apologies. I mean, Ego Povarelic comes, comes to mind. And uh, sometimes audiences can be fascinated uh, by that kind of untrammeled ego and say, well, why not? So I want to back up and talk about this a little bit, you see, because on the one hand, you, you have the question of how a musician comes to the decisions that they make, which are sometimes very deep and philosophical and emotional, but sometimes are merely practical. Every string player who plays in a piece of chamber music is used to the fact that the question of Boeing's will come up. Harry, what do you do at uh, two after B? You take it up? No, no, it's okay. You know, or you, you, want it, you, want it, maybe you want to do it down? Okay, I'll do it down bow. And of course, uh, bound up with the idea of choosing a Boeing can be what makes it most practicable and comfortable and natural on the instrument. But sometimes, and string players can teach a great deal to the rest of the musicians about this, that to decide on a fingering or to decide on a bowing has a profound effect on the phonetics of the performance. You know, if you take, for instance, you know, a typical bowing for that. You know, it seems absolutely natural to do that. And the most natural thing, of course, would be to start down bow. Because there's generally a feeling, the French don't call it down bow and up bow, they say push and pull. And that makes a good deal of sense, especially if you're a cellist, where you're not going down and up, but you're going from side to side, you see? So the idea is that there's a natural weight that comes in the down bow, so that you would almost always, if the piece starts at the beginning of the measure, you would normally be expected to start with a down bow. On the other hand, if you have a piece of music that starts with an upbeat, bop bum, you would go up down. See, this, this, this is not you know, rocket science, and it's not particularly earth-shattering either. But I remember conducting the 39th Symphony of Mozart, which is what I was just playing to you, in Des Moines, and I turned to the 
concertmaster. And I said, how about we start up both? And he, he looked very puzzled. I said, no, I said, just try it. You don't like it, we don't do it. And the, the first violins did it, and he looked at me, he said, hey, that's really good. You're a pianist, how come you know that? <laughs> you know, and I mean, for a pianist to think about Boeing's is a very, very healthy thing to do because the choice of Boeing's has a lot to do with the rhetoric of a piece. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so I'm gonna back up a little bit, all right? When a composer writes, there is perhaps a sense in the greatest geniuses, a Beethoven, for instance, that you are not only writing for right now, but for the ages. But even if you have some confidence that your music is going to leave a trace, a message, that will continue to thrill, to challenge, and even to terrify future audiences, you are in the first instance working with people who are your contemporaries. And the language that you use, while certainly personal and original, when it comes to performance practice is bound up in so many ways with the expectations, the experiences, and the conventions of that composer's own time. And as a matter of fact, in one of, at least one of the lectures I've given in the past, I have promulgated a theorem of performance practice. Performance practice being, let's not be too highfalutin about this sort of thing. It's basically how people play and how composers expect people will play, which includes things like fingerings and bowings or the use of the pedal on the piano or other details of execution. You see? And so a Beethoven writing his pieces may be transforming the language in great audacity and visionary capacity. But when it comes to the performance the next week, he is used to hearing how people are playing then. So my theorem of performance practice, which I give in particular to the fellows here, because I think it helps if you think this way, is that as a rule, what the composer writes down is confined to that information which is not obvious to a well-educated musician of the composer's own time. Boy, that's a long sentence. So let me do it again, okay? As a rule, the composer writes down only that information that is not obvious to a well-schooled musician of the composer's time. I'll give you an example. I spoke for a minute ago about Boeing's, let's talk about pedal. Czerny, Beethoven's pupil, wrote a book called On the Performance of Beethoven's Complete Music for Piano. It's a volume that every musician should own and certainly every pianist. And in it, he treats not just the piano sonatas, but the variations, the piano pieces, the, the piano concertos, including the transcription of the violin concerto, and all of the pieces that involve a piano with other instruments, the violin sonatas, the cello sonatas, the piano trios, quartet, quintet, all of these things are discussed. Metronome markings are supplied, and he makes a few observations about each of the pieces. Thus you read, when he discusses the G major piano concerto, which I think most of you have heard, the fourth concerto, it's going to be actually performed this coming season here by the Sarasota Orchestra. And most of you know it as beginning like this. example that's given by Czerny in discussing that, what you discover is something rather surprising. You 
You think, wow, on whose authority is he doing that? It's not in the edition that I got. You know, I listen to Rudolf Serkin or Wilhelm Bachhaus or, or, or Wilhelm Kemp for all these people. They don't, they don't do that. But the interesting thing is that Czerny does not say, roll the first chord. So what that means is for him, it's obvious. You would do that. You'd say, well, how would I know to do that? I invoke the theory of performance practice. You notate only that which is not obvious. So evidently, Czerny is doing something that would have been obvious to anybody. Now, I could make a little excursion about the aesthetics of rolling as opposed to not rolling that chord. But I will simply point out, I'll give you the short version of it. Interestingly enough, when Schubert returns to the state of soul of this G major concerto of Beethoven in his G major sonata, he chooses this sound. In other words, five notes whose separation gives transparency to the sound. Beethoven's, on the other hand, is thick. But it's not thick if you roll the chord. So, coming back to Czerny, he said, Beethoven used the pedal in his performances much more than he wrote it into his score. Now, why is that? I mean, why doesn't he tell you everything you're supposed to do? Like Chopin. Chopin doesn't trust anybody. <laughs> you look at the manuscripts of Chopin and the asterisk, which tells you where to let your foot up and change the pedal. You will look in the manuscript and you'll see he moves it one thirty-second note to the right or to the left. He's a stickler. Thank heavens. We can learn anything and everything you need to know about using the pedal on the piano from Chopin, provided that we have an edition that faithfully reproduces what he wrote, which you cannot be sure is the case. There is this thing called the Urtext. Yeah? It's German, it means the primeval, ultimate, original reading, which supposedly scrapes the barnacles of tradition off this music and takes you back to the intention of the composer, which is unadulterated. Sounds good. Henle, one of the prime purveyors of Urtext editions, and an edition which I greatly admire, and which has written history because they now have an app. <laughs> and you can download the app and you go into the Henley store and you give them a certain amount of money and you can download to your iPad Pro all of these Wurtext editions without additional charge and by just putting your, your, uh, your finger or using the iPad pencil you can suddenly cause all the fingerings to disappear or to come back again or to choose this person's or that person's. I mean, it's a new age. It's really fantastic. So, you know, there, there are many good things that, that Henley is doing. But keeping in mind that Henley has produced three different editions of the Beethoven sonatas, the piano sonatas, the two-volume set that most of you own, those of you who are pianists here. Then there is the complete works edition, which has no fingerings in it. And then there is the new cycle that they are doing with Norbert Gertsch and Murray Pariah. So one publisher has three different Urtext editions, and that's the point. They're all different. Every one of them claims to be giving you exactly what the composer wrote, but how come it's not the same? Because there's the editor. And if Beethoven writes at one point in the Appassionata, Slur, slur, slur. And in another place he writes. 
and connects the whole phrase, that editor says, we cannot let him do that. It has to be absolutely consistent. It's all going to be, no, 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 it's going to be, you know. Well, why does it have to be consistent? How you feel on Tuesday and how you feel on Friday doesn't have to be the same, does it? I mean, maybe you're one of those people who has your poached eggs on toast, you know, and you have your glass of, of orange juice and you have your English breakfast tea. And every morning, every single morning you have that until one day you wake up and you think, the poached eggs on toast, the English breakfast tea, I, 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 I can't do it anymore. I've had it, you know. Performing music shouldn't be like that. I invoke the wonderful American transcendental philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Maybe he was thinking about some of those musicologists who insist on standardization because they think that standardization is in and of itself a good thing. But it isn't. What's interesting is how you feel at the moment. If you're an actor, you inflect according to what you think. You choose the most important word in the sentence and, and you shape your declamation according to your view. To be or not to be. To be or not to be. There's no right or wrong about that, you see. So, if Czerny says that Beethoven used the pedal a great deal more than he wrote it, what's the reason for that? The reason for that comes back to the theorem of performance practice. He doesn't write down the pedaling that any good musician of the time would know to use. He writes down the pedalings that you would never imagine if he didn't tell you. So if he tells you he wants this, I think most of us, if, if we didn't see that pedaling, would never do that, you know? Which is not nearly so atmospheric. So there you have Beethoven showing us the non-obvious. All right. The question of what he is not telling us that we need to know is one of the justifications for performers' intervention in how to decide how to play a piece. And the question is how much unwritten information is there. The language of music is in constant flux. You know, Bach and Handel are writing music at the same time. Their music in the high Baroque style is entirely intelligible from one of these composers to the other, and yet they're not the same in many respects in terms of their vocabulary, their turns of phrase. Haydn and Mozart were best friends. They went arm in arm through the streets of Vienna to the rehearsals of Così fan tutte. Mozart dedicated his perhaps finest six string quartets to Haydn saying, these are my children, I commend them to you, do with them what you wish. And Haydn, when he learned in London of Mozart's passing, said, a hundred years will go by, and a figure like this will not come again. These, these were people who were soul brothers, and yet if you listen to a Haydn piece or a Mozart piece, you can almost invariably tell them apart, as you can tell apart Mendelssohn and Schumann, or Bruckner and Mahler, or Debussy and Ravel. Their lingos, their brogues, are specific. And yet, Ravel and Debussy, for instance, were not fond of indicating the pedalings that the piano should play. There's scarcely a composer of piano music whose music is more dependent on the proper use of pedal than Debussy, but there isn't a single pedal indication from the beginning to the end. 
So some people see dots, you know, dots means staccato, light and short. And they think, well, if he's telling you dots, then that must mean that you're not allowed to use the pedal. Wrong! <laughs> if he wants you not to use the pedal, he writes dry, sick. Then you know. But Debussy is following a tradition that was set up by Chopin, and to some extent by some of the composers before, but never to the degree of Chopin which is that the signs of execution, these dots or dashes, these other things that tell you about the nature of how you play, have to do not so much with whether the sound is held or the sound is released, but how you use your fingers to create the sound. Because there's a big difference between these two executions, which I will show you, both of which hold the pedal down, but one of them keeps the fingers on the, on the keys depressed, and the other which bounces. You see, in the second case, when I bounce, there's a kind of explosive attack and then an afterglow which is central to the performance of French music. If you did it in Brahms, it would be a crime because that's not within the vocabulary. So at, in every age, there are conventional symbols which people know how to execute. Bach, when teaching his young son, Wilhelm Friedemann, how to play the keyboard, writes a table of ornaments. And he says, this symbol means you do this, and this one means you do that. How fortunate we are that Bach educated his son, because he thereby educates us. Then we see those symbols and we know what they mean. They are what is known as the involuntary decorations. Involuntary because the symbol on the page has an invariable and unique way of being performed. If it goes like this, it's ba da da da. If it's this with a thing in the middle, it's da da da. And if it's it's the see. And there is a right way to do that, and an incorrect way to do that. Or maybe there are many incorrect ways to do it. But that's what Bach prescribes. So people who say you don't know how to play Bach because it was too long ago, they're not. You know, they're too lazy not to look into what it is possible to know. And at the same time on the European con continent, Mr. Rameau is writing harpsichord music and Mr. Couperin is writing harpsichord music, but their symbols for these involuntary decorations are different because they come from a different place. You know, Tabasco sauce comes from New Iberia, Louisiana. That's where it comes from. It doesn't come from Belgium. And we have all of these peppers, don't we? We have black pepper, we have white pepper, we have Sichuan pepper, we have chili pepper, we have all of these different jalapenos, all of these things. They're all pepper, but you know, it really matters which one you use. And in music, the herbs and the spices are very, very important. Inflection is very, very important. So you have the involuntary decorations, which are decorations as I say, which are exactly prescribed, and that's how you do them. And then there are the voluntary decorations. The voluntary decorations mean do what you want. You see? So Mozart writes, now he writes a trill. A lot of people play. But that's because they don't understand his language of notation. It would be, normally, that's how you would terminate the trill. And then go on. If he writes, then this is not an addition to that. It's instead of it. No. So either you know that or you don't. If you don't know it, then you're executing it imperfectly, you see. Now. 
See, all of those are things that Mozart didn't write, but he could have because they're within his language. And those are voluntary decorations. I choose to do them. There's not one way of doing them. They're freely invented. And maybe some other time I'll come down here and give a talk about what we know about how to decorate repeats. It'll shock you. <laughs> but that's not my subject for today. That's a subset of things. And then I'll come in and I'll give you a PowerPoint presentation and you get to see all sorts of stuff. It's kind of interesting. I'm working on the CPE Bach sonatas with varied reprises right now for the Complete Works edition. I'm almost finished. It's going to come out rather soon, by the end of the year. And when I saw what he said, I thought, oh my God, this means that everybody who's playing Haydn sonatas, Mozart sonatas, Beethoven early sonatas, they're, they're, they're not doing it the way it was expected. Okay, that's, that's just a grabber for the future. <laughs> so, what we come to in those things which are matters of execution is the distinction between execution and expression. And those people who were inclined to write treatises about performance practice tend to distinguish between execution and expression. So let's define the difference, because for you performers, you fellows, this is very, very important. Execution is the way you would normally declaim something independent of the character or the dramatic situation. In other words, we say mother. We don't say mother. And under no circumstances, if you were an actor and you were pleading with someone to spare your mother, you wouldn't say, please don't do anything to her. She's my mother. Because if you did that, people would laugh because it's completely grotesque because the accent is on the wrong syllable. <laughs> so the rules of execution will tell you that whether you are pleading, whether you're terrified, whether you are blissful, whether you are tender, you will say, mother. And that ornament will be executed like so. And this will be done this way. And the dot means this, and the stroke means that, and the slur means this, and the dot with the dash means that. All of these things. And then we have to decide with Brahms whether poco forte is less than mezzo forte or more than mezzo forte. You see, because every composer has his own particular peccadillos about, about what they do that means that even though we learn in, in conservatory, basic definitions of everything, often they only apply in a very personal way to individual composers. So execution is the normative way you play, regardless of the particular situation. Expression is, of course, the opposite. Expression says, given the character that I discern in this piece of music, which is pathetic, which is entreating, which is furious, which is sublimely blissful, that will determine how I inflect, how I perform. So execution on the one hand and expression on the other. Leopold Mozart in his, music, his violin school, which every musician should own and read, says, in order to determine the proper tempo of a piece of music, you must first determine its character. He says so many wonderful things. Some of them are obvious and not so obvious. He says the best measure in a piece to select the proper tempo is not always the first one. That is really good advice. Yeah. And so you have most of the 18th century treatises are about execution the normative way of playing. They'll contain a few slim pages about expression, which says that you should try to find the proper character of the piece, its 
emotion and so on and make sure that how you play reflects your understanding of what the composer is trying to express. Now, a man named Gustav Schilling wrote a treatise quite late, actually, 1838, in the heyday of Schumann and Chopin and so on and so forth, Het Mendelssohn. So it seems a little shocking that he's writing what he does that late. But you have to remember that people who write treatises are always talking about the past. And so if you want to know how to play J.S. Bach, read the treatise written by his son CPE in 1753, essay on the true manner of playing the clavier, because his father was the only teacher he had. So everything that he's writing there sums up his whole musical upbringing and reflects. On the other hand, Leopold Mozart's violin school was published the year that his son, his famous son, was born. And his son basically studied almost exclusively with his father. So what his father is saying in 1756 shows you how he taught his son. So it can go one generation this way or one generation that way. Now, Gustav Schilling, I haven't forgotten him, talks about the distinction between execution and expression that I just explained to you. And then he says something which I think may rile some of the fellows over here. He says, it is doubtless possible to perform a piece with the proper execution and not succeed in conveying the appropriate expression. But the reverse is not possible. And I think we're very allergic to that. Because we think expression is everything. Who cares if you mess up the ornament? You know, if you think this is passionate or if you think this is brooding or if you think this is furious, that's what matters. Never mind all of that other stuff. And there's Schilling saying, you can't have proper expression unless you understand the principles of execution. And the principles of execution should exercise a constraint on us performers showing outer limits of things that we should not do because they do not agree with the brogue, with the dialect of a particular composer. Now, it takes a certain amount of curiosity to look through the works of J.S. Bach or the works of Johannes Brahms and to see the way they use notation and what it suggests about how they expect you to play. And unfortunately, our education in these matters is rather meager. Nobody taught this stuff to me. I just got to be in my bonnet about it over a period of time. I wanted to learn more about it, so I started looking for what I call smoking guns. <clears throat> that is, passages in a piece of music which show for once and for all whether you got to perform it like this or you got to perform it like that. And I keep on discovering these things. And I get very excited about it. Some people think I just, you know, uh, you know, so, so what? But I'll give you an example. A couple years ago, I invented a rule. I invented it. But the situation that caused me to invent it is not artificial. And I think within a couple of minutes when I explain it to you, You'll agree. Carmi, you already know, because <laughs> we talked about it the other day in the rehearsal. My invention is called the repeated note, main note, trill rule. Now, let's just step back for a minute. Trills, as you know, are, you know. So. Now, of course, there is the question. Do you start on the principal note, that is the note that's on the page, below which the trill abbreviation is, and so therefore you play? Or do you play it from the upper note? It's not simple. Through the beginning of the 19th century, upper note execution was normal and preferred in part because it's like a little shot of lemon juice in the center of the tongue. It gives you a little bit of dissonance. So the difference between this and this. Now, what 
what's really fascinating is the capacity of our brain to prolong the initial effect. Because once I start to play, uh, or I play this, it basically sounds the same. It's only that one tiny fraction of a second which begins this way or begins that way, which is different. And yet, what our ear hears, if you start on the main note, is the basic agreement with the harmony and a little decoration. Whereas if I do it the other way, we hear the prolongation of the dissonance. When I learned the Beethoven Piano Concerto number one, when I was a teenager, that's how I learned it. I don't do that anymore. much more explosive because it perpetuates an incredible dissonance with the strings that are playing underneath. Well, I mean, when Beethoven was writing that piece, upper note trills were the rule. Main note trills were the exception, and there were a series of exceptions. I'm not going to bore you with them here. But I come back to the repeated note, main note trill rule. You see, when a composer writes a particular passage in a particular way. That can contain positive information or it can contain negative information. To return to Czerny's Beethoven book, he says when playing the Moonlight Sonata, the famous motif, dum pa pam, yeah? he says, don't line the 16th note, that's the short note of ba, ba, ba. Don't line that up with the triplet. Bo, ro, di, do, ro, do, do. So he says, don't do this. And I think all of you pianists in the, in the audience can say, well, nobody does that. Why is he even saying it? Why is he saying it? There can be only one answer. He's saying it because he fears if he doesn't tell you, you're going to do it. So his telling you not to do it in the Moonlight Sonata is his way of telling you that normally when you have a dotted eighth and a sixteenth and a triplet, you're going to align them. See, that's negative information, but it's not less useful than positive information. So you don't want to play. In Schubert, this is a big deal. Lots of triplets and dotted rhythms. So that's a good example of negative information. So one day I'm looking at a Beethoven sonata, one of his early sonatas, Opus 2, number 3, this one. At the end of the coda and in other places in the piece, we see this. trill many times and Beethoven writes a tiny note above it basically saying start the trill on the upper note but wait a minute in the early 1790s when Beethoven was writing his piano sonatas people played the trills on the upper note so everybody would do it anyway but Beethoven is telling us to do it why is he telling us to do it? You see, negative information. He's telling you to go dot dot yellum because he is certain that if he doesn't tell you to do that, you are going to play the trill on the main note and play. And you say, well, but wait a minute. Why would they do that? Why would they do that 
when in fact people are starting trills starting on the upper note. Why does he feel he has to tell you that? Ah, the repeated note main note trill rule. That means that if you are playing a trill on a note and the previous note is the same note, then exceptionally you'll play it on the main note and therefore play bum, bum, ba, da, da, dum. And people know how to do that. But in this particular case, he doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to play it on the upper note. And even though upper note execution is normal, he's got to show you in this case because he knows you're going to do it another way. And that is impossible to explain unless you acknowledge the existence of the repeated note main note trill rule. So you see, I made it up. But all I'm doing is trying to understand why Beethoven writes something the way he writes it. Now, you know, this kind of stuff takes a lot of time that could be better spent perhaps practicing. <laughs> Which is why I don't mind, because, you know, I've, I've got these kinds of ob obsessions. I don't mind taking the time so that I can tell all of you this stuff and you don't have to take time from your practicing, because now you know! <laughs> you see? And that's why... Sounds like a main note trill that started too early. Is that... See, that's another example of the repeated note main note trill rule. So just keep it in the back of your mind. It may not change everything about how you play that particular Beethoven sonata, but it has to do with turns of phrase and particularities. Remember, as we go from century to century or from era to era, what are composers doing? Most of them are telling stories. And telling stories is not merely about architecture, but the rhythms, the melodic shapes, all of the content, the surface of the piece that we spend so many hours trying to perfect, that surface shows you how people move, how they gesticulate, the color of their eyes, the color of the dress that they are wearing, what their shoes look like, their portraits, somebody's phone. They depict how people behave at a particular moment in time. And therefore, when we look at that surface, if all we do is take it as a recipe in a cookbook, we won't get it. Because what has to happen is a figure, three-dimensional figure in color, has to leap out of the abstract language of music and become a live human being with a particular aspect, with a particular history. If you're going to play the Mozart F major sonata, K533, and it begins, There's a disaster in the second bar. He starts. <laughs> you think, oh my God. What's that? Something must have happened to this person. I want to find out what it is. Do you suppose we can find out? I don't know. I don't know. We hear. stuff, you know? And the amazing thing is, in this entire movement, Mozart does not once tell you to play something loud or soft. I mean, obviously, you can't play the whole thing at, at, at a level like that. The music is crazy. Something's going on. You've got to characterize it. You've got to figure it out. You have to figure out what's the outburst and what's the terror. You see? And then it goes on. What became... What was this? Suddenly it becomes this.
so sorry. Oh, my God, I had no idea. But you see, that incredible explosion is an outcome of the truth of the story of this person that blurted within seconds of the beginning their anguish. And we had to find out, and we do. Which is why, if you're playing a piece like that, which has no dynamics whatsoever, and you get a person who thinks that the most important thing about Mozart is to make him pretty, then they will get to that point in the piece, and they will play like this, and a lot of people do. That's, that's not it, you know? That substitutes some kind of gracefulness, some notion of, of gentle prettiness for one of the most harrowing pages that Mozart ever left us. So deciphering the language is a terribly important thing. And when you compare that to an Ogle, uh, uh, Evo Pogorelich that's saying, it says loud, so I'm going to play soft, so I can show you that I've got an imagination. There's so much in the way of character and autobiography that these pieces convey that we need to immerse ourselves in the language and the plot and how this becomes that, so that the audience within seconds is fascinated and absorb the way we are in the movies. For God's sake, if, if Mozart isn't as interesting as Mission Impossible, is that his fault? <laughs> you know, we cannot do this, we performers, without getting to the core of truth of what happens. That you walk into an art museum and you find yourself drawn to a picture on the side of the museum and you come and you look at it and, and you start to weep because the, in, the, the, the face is in such suffering, and you have to tell yourself, yeah, but this was 300 years ago. So what does it have to do with me? Everything has to do with us. You see, I said this in the first coaching of the, of the Brahms A minor piano, uh, clarinet piano and cello trio the other day. I often ask people, I say to them, why in the year of our Lord, 2019, do we find it necessary to play the music of dead white men? You know, and there are a lot of people in this country who speak derogatorily about, we don't need this stuff, it's no longer there. And people who believe that Beethoven or Schubert or Scriabin, you know, to say nothing of Bach or Mendelssohn or Chopin, have nothing to say to us because they're dead white men, they wave the banner of Eurocentrism and say, that's irrelevant now. You know, we're the United States of America, we've got our own culture which we do. But what music was Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson listening to? And by the way, what part of the world inspired the United States Constitution, which has been in force longer than any constitution for any country in the history of the world? During the time that we've had one constitution, France has had five republics, two empires, two monarchies, a commune, a Vichy fascist government, and we've had one constitution. Don't tell me England, Magna Carta is not a constitution. Nope. It's us. And where we got it was from Western European liberal thought. And it was the people who were educated in that way that defined an attitude that makes this country a refuge and a model for every place. If all of the people want to come here, there are two reasons. One of them is because they cherish freedom, and the other reason is they cherish economic opportunity. And those things come from a system of government that makes it possible. Huh? I'm not taking sides in the, in the presidential contest here. You know, this, this is, this is, I want to say this is not about that. It is about protecting our citizenry against assaults on the rule of law that come from a constitution that defines what's right and what's wrong, which is perhaps more momentous than deciding whether that little squiggle on the page means that you start the trill on the upper note or on the main note. But it's part of social behavior, you see. 
And the way you execute a trill has to do with the, with the color of the feather that the man wears in his black hat. And he walks in with a red feather and he takes a deep bow in front of the court and all of the women are staring at the red feather because they think, oh, this is a cool guy, you see. In the 18th century in France, there was a, a um, how shall I say, a proverb, if you wish, a kind of motto. Le style est l'homme même. Style is the essence of the man. So it's not who you were, but how you looked. You know, you look snazzy, people may pay attention to you. And music is a lot about that. Now, meanwhile, of course, going from the sense that we play this music of the white, the dead white men, we need to have some understanding about why we want to do this. And God thank the Asians for showing us that there's something worthwhile in this culture that should be preserved. Because all you have to do is go to the auditions for any conservatory in Europe or America or even in New Zealand and Australia and two thirds and more of the applicants are from Asian countries. God bless them, you know. They are being taught that there's something in this music that is worthy of their attention, their love, their passion, their despair, their hopes. And the reason that we need, ladies and gentlemen, to play the music of dead white men is because it's about us. It was never, ever about anything else. A mirror held up to you saying, do you see? Do you see the consequences of how you live? Do you understand what might happen to you but for the grace of God? Do you? Don't blame me, I tried to warn you, I did everything I could. Schubert telling us what the abyss of terror is as no other composer in history was able to do. Terrifying stuff. Stuff that if it changes our lives, could redeem us. The things that we should hope as performers will cause an audience member who attended our concert to suddenly wake up at quarter of three in the morning shaking and remembering a moment in that Schubert G major string quartet that you played. Changed forever by what you showed them about a life which might just be theirs. So what I'm advocating here is an understanding that of course performance is like acting. But there is an ethics of performance. There is the correctness, as we see, in execution. There is the responsibility we have of ferreting out the emotional background that causes people to say what they say when they say it, that makes the palpable the curvature of storytelling that these composers pr propose to us. And understanding that, of course, alongside those people who are painting pictures of you and of me, there are people like C.P.E. Bach and Beethoven who say, I know about you, but what I really know about is myself. So let me tell you what I put in my diary last night. Let me tell you about the dream I had. I had a vision. I think you want to hear it. And Beethoven changed the culture of music by turning inward, particularly as a result of his deafness. And his music became a testimony to his hopes and his fears. And in some ways, he remains the, the most modern composer ever because he did that. And we who propose to play this music cannot be content simply because our intonation is good, because our ensemble is good, because we chose a good Boeing. It's all a means to an end. Everything is an instrument. Your violin under your chin is the instrument. My piano here, my oboe, and, and the reeds that I painstakingly make, they are instruments. But my mind is an instrument. The mind is making these decisions. It is seeing that this particular passage has a character of tenderness, or of voluptuousness, or of bliss, or of serenity, or of fright. Decisions that we have to make reading the code that's written down. 
and we can find out about the execution. We have to trust ourselves somewhat with the expression, but our idea is to try to ferret out from what we see what the composer is thinking. Not like so many of the opera directors who put Don Giovanni in an automobile plant to show you that they can do anything they want. I saw Don Giovanni at the Juilliard School. Carmine Zori was there too. And at the end of the whole thing, you know what happens. He gets dragged down to hell. And then in the, the final scene, the characters are all kind of dazed and strolling around the stage. Because Don Giovanni, this fascinating, horrifying figure, has changed each of their lives forever. And once he's gone and in hell, they're all disoriented. They don't know what to do because they're, they were fighting him or they were in love with him or they were attracted to him and they're all sort of stuck. It's quite an amazing piece of characterization. But this director wasn't happy with that. When it came to the end, all of a sudden, Don Giovanni shows up on stage, grabs Donna Anna and goes off and rapes her. I saw The Marriage of Figaro at the Salzburg Festival and in the beginning of the second act, where Carabino is trying on the clothes with, with uh, Susanna and with the Countess, this wonderful mise-en-scene had Carabino having sex with the Countess. Well, if Carabino has sex with the Countess, you don't have a story. And up above are the supertitles. The supertitles are telling you everything that isn't happening. You know, when Peter Sellers had Don Giovanni take place in the South Bronx, that's fine. We had Carmen Jones, too, you know, that put Carmen into the 20th century. It's fine to have Don Giovanni in the South Bronx, but what's coming out of a ghetto blaster can't be Mozart. It's got to be gangster rap. Then you do a new, a new opera. It's fine. We have to read the semiotics of these things. I mean, Mozart was enough of a, of a social historian that in the end of the first act, he has three different orchestras playing three different dances simultaneously to show you what the different the classes were. You've got the minuet, which is the aristocracy, and Donna Anna and Don Ottavio dance the minuet. Then you have the, the, the peasants with the German dance, and there you have Mazzetto, who is, of course, the fiancé of Cialina, and we have Leporello, who's trying to distract them, so they're dancing the, the peasant dance, and in the middle you have the country dance, and there you have Don Giovanni, who is an aristocrat, who descends one level to the middle, and he takes Serlina, who's in the bottom level, up to the middle, and they dance the country dance, and you hear these three different dances, and you know everything you need to know about the social relations of the 18th century. Why on earth would you bother to do that in an opera? Because you're a chronicle of the human condition, you see? So what I'm telling you is there's so much information in this music. Once you crack the code, you can do all of this. Part of it is the performance practice stuff, knowing that diminuendo in Schubert doesn't mean just getting softer, but also means getting slower. That sostenuto in Brahms means playing slower. That retard in Schumann means taking rubatos. All of this stuff, it'll help you. It'll get you closer to their way of talking. But in the end, the execution is not the goal. Perfection of declamation is not the goal. It's the prerequisite. It's what you do when you walk in. We assume all of that. Now, what are you going to do to change our lives? Huh? What are you going to do to mess us up real good? If you're not contributing to the survival of the art, then you are simply being a parasite who simply presents the music that people like and feed off it. Because if you're not playing music that's being written right now, you're not fighting for the survival of our art. Because one of these days, Beethoven is going to be just as old as Josquin Desprez. And how do we know if we haven't blown ourselves up or destroyed our climate forever within 200 years? How do we know in 200 years that people will still be interested in Beethoven? We've got to keep the chain of artistic development alive. So please, you young musicians, you go to the racetrack and bet on a horse. I don't know who you're going to choose. You choose somebody, some composer whose music speaks to you in a particular way. And you go to the barricades and you play that music. If your composer doesn't make it to the Pantheon. 
you will still have fought the good battle. But if, in fact, you choose somebody who makes it that way, then you will be the future equivalent of what Joachim or Mühlfeld were to Brahms or Stadler was to Mozart. People talk about Anton Stadler for only one reason, because Mozart wrote a clarinet concerto and a clarinet quintet for him. And without Stadler, we wouldn't have him. When I was a senior in high school, I met a guy named John Harbis, and nobody knew the hell he was. Nobody. I asked him if he would conduct a concert of mine, my senior recital, and his wife would play the violin, Rosemary Harbison, a wonderful violinist. I said, John, you're, you're a composer. Show me some of your music. I looked at the music. I said, God, this guy's got it. This, this is the real thing. I don't need to write my own music that no one's going to play. I'm going to play this guy's music. And I've been doing that now for 50 years. And now nobody asks who John Harbison is because the great Gatsby Opera was commissioned by the Met and played in Dresden. And he's been played in Santa Fe. He's won every prize you can win, the Genius Grant from the MacArthur Foundation, the Kennedy Center Prize, the Pulitzer Prize, and so on and so forth. So my horse, you know, he, he won the, the, the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont Stakes. He won the Triple Crown, you see? So maybe I just got lucky. I chose the right guy. But even if I chose the guy who didn't make it, I'm still doing something that's important. Because you people over here need to listen to what those people over there are telling you about where we're headed. Do I have you riled up enough? <laughs> uh, you all, all of us have to work harder. This is our heritage. And it means something. And as I say, our job as priests and priestesses of music, our job is to keep people up at night because it's two minutes to 12 for classical music. And this must not, must not be the generation which caused people to say goodbye and say, as Americans do, well, if it doesn't support itself economically, it deserves to die. Sorry. You know, what would Michelangelo have done without the Medici? There have always been those people. Music, art exists through patronage. That's what it is. In the old days, it was the church and the kings and the emperors. And then it became, in Europe, the governments, which we have resisted. In this country, it's a matter of philanthropy. But one way or another, you know, you get people who are pulling away from sponsoring the opera and the ballet and the symphony orchestras and all of this, and they're supporting NASCAR. I mean, that's easy, isn't it? Huh? So all of us have our homework. All of us have a job to do. But for those of us who are going to shape where this art is heading, put features on its face, define it. For those of us who are going to do that, we must have a generous heart, an absolute sense of idealism, an unquenchable thirst and curiosity to find out the deep, dark secrets behind what caused that pen to be placed on that piece of paper and thereby traced a vision that will nourish our human beings as long as this race continues to exist.